hope everyone's doing well. Um, welcome uh, to our, our fourth and likely final. Um, there, if there's a lot of interest, I might do one more of these because I feel like there's about 20 other things that I want to talk about. But, um, uh, but in any case, that's always the case. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk about the uh, Falmouth or the, the Cape Cod Festival of Strawberries, uh, what's sometimes known as the Cape Cod Strawberry Festival or Falmouth Strawberry Festival. Um, the, uh, uh, the festival was really an interesting forerunner. We were talking a little bit uh, before everyone started coming into the room and we started recording about uh, Falmouth's uh, contemporary tourism industry. And um, this is really something that was developed uh, since, the, since the 1950s. And uh, when we talk about the, uh, the legacy of Falmouth strawberry uh, industry, we, we really, we talk about two things. One, we talk about the construction trades because most of the Portuguese went after they, uh, they, they left uh, strawberries and the decline of the strawberry industry in the 50s. Um, they took up the construction trades. But the other thing that ended up being very important for Falmouth's economy has been um, the, uh, the tourist industry, as everybody obviously knows. So um, the, the kind of the forerunner for this and one of the, the, the major moments of, uh, of Falmouth's um, entry into the tourism industry came in the 1950s, uh, in 1951, in the form of the Cape Cod Festival of Strawberries. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you all, and uh, we'll start off talking about, uh, so hopefully you can see uh, uh, hopefully you all see my, my screen here, rituals and festivals. Yes, if I could get a confirmation. Yes, can does everybody see my screen? Yes, my, uh, yes. 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 Okay. okay, thanks. So, um, all right. So um, as you can see here, um, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, we're, we're talking today about um, the Cape Cod Festival of Strawberries. Let me just give you a couple of quick takeaways here um, as, I, as I give you some a little bit of, a, um, of, of some background on this. Um, you have to remember that the strawberry industry in Falmouth really starts to, to head, take a dive in the, in, in the 50s. And there's a couple of reasons for this and, and a couple of things that are attributed to it. Um, if any of you were at Lou uh, White and, um, and, and my um, uh, last JOL uh, class that we had or course that we taught last, last time around, uh, we go into some of these reasons and talk about the, the, the decline of this industry. Um, mainly, um, you have two, a couple of main issues. One is, um, as the interstate highway system starts to get built in the post-World War II era, you have competition of strawberries from all kinds of places all over the, all over the states. Um, but, but, you know, part particularly regionally, you have uh, crops coming down from Canada, from Maine, um, into Massachusetts, from New Jersey, from Massachusetts. Um, and this was something that really was not um, you know, an issue in, in the 20s because the crops would be spoiling. They would spoil by the time they ever got there. Um, so, so really uh, Falmouth was able to dominate this industry for, for a long time. But with all this competition also came uh, a number of other uh, shortages. There were, there were tremendous labor shortages that started to take place. Um, and then as well um, in the post-World War II era, you had uh, Camp Edwards being built and really being staffed with a lot of people, which created a massive housing boom um, and if any of you remember some of Lou, Lou White's great slides, um, uh, that he really, he really brought home the incredible uh, housing boom that took place in this period. And a lot of strawberry farmers realized that it was a lot easier and they could make a lot more money by developing land uh, for, uh, you know, for housing development rather than, for, um, rather than to cultivate strawberries. Nonetheless, the, the Cape Cod Festival of Strawberries is the brainchild um, uh, of, a, um, of, of some, fa some Falmouth people, although it ends up getting uh, um, uh, farmed out, most of the work ends up getting farmed out to some, pe to some people from outside of town. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, the, um, effectively, the very first one was uh, kind of a mixed bag. On the one hand, it was a huge disaster uh, in practical terms. It was a disaster in the fact that it lost about $10,000 and $9,000. Um, the, the company that, that staged it made a lot of mistakes. They didn't really involve, um, the, 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 it really wasn't about Falmouth. It wasn't real, a real Falmouth festival in some ways. It was um, this, this uh, theater company that kind of put it on and they used their, their formula for doing these all over the country. Uh, the Portuguese were largely an afterthought until much later in the process, uh, even though this ostensibly was a festival to support uh, the, the strawberry growers of Falmouth. Um, but they really, they really weren't, it really wasn't about that. Um, and, um, 
you know, there were some positive outcomes that came out of it, especially uh, understanding uh, how, how marketing could work. Um, however, that marketing ends up not really being used for strawberries. It ends up really being used for tourism um, in, the, in the subsequent decades. Um, but we'll talk about that uh, as, we, uh, as we go along here. So just to give you kind of like a, a score sheet here of some of the key people that I'm gonna be referring to, uh, feel free to take a screenshot and refer back to this um, if you would. Um, we have John C. Peterson or the self-styled Captain John Peterson, who was really a charter boat captain. Um, but his big claim to fame was he was the owner of the Cape Cotter Hotel. And he was kind of a marketing, uh, an, an early marketing genius. Um, Robert Morse, the, uh, the Broadway actor and the former actor that played in the Mad Men the series, Mad Men, if you ever saw that, um, uh, was uh, typified. And actually one of the earliest Mad Men is another Falmouth guy who was a restaurateur in Falmouth, a guy named, um, uh, uh, oh my God, I can't think of his name. He owned the, uh, the regatta bar. Uh, 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 Brant, Brants was his name. I, I, I can remember his wife's name, which was Wendy Brants. I can't think of his name. If anybody knows, unmute yourself and shout it out to me uh, if you can remember his name. Um, but anyway, uh, he was the Brant guy that Bryant. was... Yeah, Brants Bryant, thank you very much. Uh, whoever said that, I appreciate it. Um, uh, uh, yeah, he uh, was, was reputed to have been one of the guys that actually came up with or worked on the team that came up with um, a way to sell Instead of people taking one Alka-Seltzer, they could take two Alka-Seltzers. And um, they did this by creating a jingle, which was plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Well, you know, you got to take two Alka-Seltzers because that's what the song says to do. Um, and apparently he was on this marketing campaign. At least that's the folklore. Peterson was another guy that had a lot of great ideas about how to market the Cape for, um, for tourism. Um, as the main guy, in the, as the owner of the Cape Codder, which was at that time the largest hotel in Cape Cod, reputably one of the first to have an outdoor pool. Um, he had all kinds of ideas. Uh, he had all kinds of ideas to try and market um, uh, uh, Falmouth as a tourist destination. And one of the things that he came up with was, a, uh, was this idea of having a, um, a strawberry festival. Um, John Rogers Producing Company, I'm gonna talk about them in a second. Basically they were an Ohio-based theatrical firm, uh, production firm. Um, that uh, was responsible for the management and operation and, and, and the actual practical running of the, uh, of the, of the Strawberry Festival in 1951. H.R. Pitts was uh, John B. Rogers' man in town. Uh, he was the festival's agent. Um, again, not a Falmouth guy. He was a guy who played, uh, he was from Canada, played pro hockey in Detroit and lived in Larchmont and went around the country pr producing uh, these events for John Rogers' company. Um, another key, key guy was Falmouth Board of Trade uh, President uh, uh, Nathan Isaacson, who's owner of Isaacson's uh, store, which is a, a, st a store that's well known to everyone from Falmouth. A, um, uh, you know, I guess it was a, a, cl a clothing store uh, in Falmouth um, that you know, my mother would always take me shopping at when I was a little kid before the first day of school. Um, and interestingly, Isaacson's had some ties into the Portuguese community. I don't know why that is. I'm sure some people um, in this room might be able to tell me that. But um, uh, I came across uh, Isaacson's advertising actually in some of the Portuguese newspapers um, in, in uh, New England, the Diário de Notícias, published out of uh, New Bedford. Uh, the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce was really the main impetus behind this all. And they really worked with, um, including Nathan Cook, who was the executive secretary, and he worked with John Peterson. Um, they ended up putting up a, quite a bit of money for this. And then um, uh, Portuguese were involved, uh, notably Tony Andrews and Marina Andrews were, were involved almost from the outset. But most of the Portuguese weren't really involved until much later in the process once uh, the whole planning started to go south. And really uh, the Portuguese and including, uh, including this group, Bertrand Tomlinson who was not Portuguese, but he was a county, cultural, county um, agricultural agent. Um, and again, when I say Portuguese, I say this every time, but we're talking about um, a pre-1974 definition of, of um, these individuals, not talking about where they're from or how they might have self-identified. Um, the Portuguese community consisted of people from the 1950s, consisted of people mostly from the Azores and Cabo Verde, um, both territories of Portugal, as well as from continental Portugal as well. Um, but most of these people could refer to themselves as Portuguese, so I will intermittently refer to them in different ways, but I just want to make that very clear. Um, Bertrand Tomlinson was not Portuguese, but he was a very important figure that really was a liaison between um, the, the Portuguese strawberry growers and everybody else in town, including the, uh, the money men, including the agricultural scientists in, in, um, uh, in, uh, out in Amherst and, um, and the state as well. So the early meetings uh, for this event take place in like 19, early 1950s. Um, 
you've got um, and, and more really you've got um, uh, the, the, the event um, uh, s starts to um, hold on I'm trying to get rid of my screen here I don't know how to do this let me do this yeah there it is so um, uh, the, fir the first uh, meetings take place and they you know they go through some name changes they thought that calling it a festival would be too much like a church fair and they really had a dream for this that it was going to be a massive undertaking um, you know that where all kinds of publicity would be involved they would get the Fox News Service, Paramount News Services to do newsreels about the event. I tried to, to run some of those down, I couldn't find them. But in any case, um, um, uh, Peterson was a real marketing guru that, uh, had, that had this idea, uh, you know, really to I muted you, but okay. Sorry. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm back, I think. Um, you know, to really try and um, uh, to, to, to mount this, uh, this, whole, uh, this whole conference. The Chamber of Commerce, Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce puts up six grand for the event and um, the town hall puts up 3,500, none of which they got back. And, um, and, and on top of it, the event actually took, you know, came up 9,000 short um, and, they, and it lost money. Uh, it, lost, it lost quite a bit of money. So the first thing that the, the, the Com Chamber of Commerce did, that $6,000 uh, there, was entirely to be paid to the John B. Rogers Producing Company. Now, John B. Rogers Producing Company was a really interesting early marketing company uh, that existed in the US. It actually ends up existing until about the 80s, although it moves to uh, Pittsburgh after having been in Fastoria, Ohio, since, uh, since the early 1900s. Um, basically, over this time period, uh, they put on, uh, up until the 50s, they put on around 2,000, but through the 80s, they put, they put on around 5,000 and they would do 70 a summer where they'd send their crews all over the country. Um, and they would basically put on theatrical events for different towns, small towns like Falmouth who didn't, didn't really have the resources or the know-how would hire them. And they would come in and give costumes, grease paint. They would um, you know, provide scripts uh, for, uh, for amateur theater productions um, and, uh, and also give kind of the, the, the overall plan on how to run a, uh, how to run kind of a, a pageant or a festival. Now, um, Peters, um, uh, Peterson actually studied how to do some of these. And he went on a tour uh, down south in uh, Florida uh, for all of the citrus festivals that were taking place. Um, he also went to a number of other touristic places that, uh, you know, this is in the early days of the development of the tourist industry in, uh, you know, in Florida. Um, uh, where you have uh, Palm Beach or West Palm Beach, Miami Beach, Daytona Beach, all these places were starting to really um, think about how to bring tourists into, uh, into the community. And what they would put on were these citrus festivals around, um, you know, around um, uh, uh, oranges, but there was actually also some strawberry production in Florida, including in Plant City. And they went down to the Plant City Festival, which Rogers uh, pr Producing Company also worked on to kind of check it out and see, you know, how, how, how it went. Um, so they come back to Falmouth and uh, they hire these guys. Uh, Rogers Company, um, you know, would put on, they had, a, they had kind of a formula of, of the kinds of things that they would do. And basically they just took that formula and applied it to every single town that they went to. Um, and, um, you know, they did other things too. Like, I mean, I, I include these two pictures so you kind of see, uh, they ran uh, what I would call historical pageants in quotes. Um, they were quite ahistorical, obviously, uh, really relying on a lot of stereotypes and mythologies, this kind of, you know, um, 1950s or 60s representation of a, uh, of a Native American uh, riding on the horse. And, uh, you know, for example, they also had um, their depictions in Falmouth uh, in, the, in one of the events that they did also had Native Americans riding on horses, which, of course, is, is not how um, uh, Native Americans uh, um, were, were getting around the Cape at that, you know, at that time. Um, so it, it was very ahistorical. It obviously was not about the natives. It was about perpetuating mythologies. And you can also see that they were also involved in creating amateur minstrel shows, or they would provide scripts and costumes for communities also to put on minstrel shows. This is one of the, um, one of the things from one of their minstrel shows, um, as you can see in Moline, Illinois, uh, from this little image down here. So just to give you an idea of what Rogers uh, Producing Company was really all about. Um, they did have some history in Falmouth. I, I dug up something that in 36, um, oh, I should mention actually in this that um, Margaret Huff Russell, if anybody's interested in kind of an overview of this event, uh, did a great uh, little article in um, the Sp uh, Spritzel, which is again, a publication I always talk about, um, put up by Whitzel Historical um, uh, uh, Museum or Library, or uh, Historical Museum rather. And um, um, they, they have a lot of great stuff about Falmouth history. 
Um, uh, Margaret Russell has like a nice thumbnail sketch of some of these things. She got some things wrong, uh, some factual things wrong. And, um, um, and, and I think that uh, also she doesn't really uh, go into a lot of depth on some of the things that I'm gonna try and go into depth in on today. But if, if you want a, a short little summary of some of these things, it's a great article, check it out. It's all online as, we, as is the case with all of Spritzel's, um, Spritzel's articles. So um, Roger's formula for the event, what was his formula? Uh, basically, um, you know, they put on stuff. I, I have this image here of uh, Harold Hill and the Music Man because, uh, you know, um, Roger's uh, producing company had nothing on Meredith Williams, the Music Man, um, especially with what happened in town. Um, to, to point this out, in 1936, they actually had an earlier um, uh, signed a contract with Falmouth for $7,500 to put on the town's, um, uh, uh, I guess it would be the tricentenary at that point, um, the, the 300th year anniversary in uh, 1936. And, um, um, or the, the 200, no, 1686 was the 350th, right? So this, it would have been the 300th. Um, anyway, they, they, um, they ended up basically not really doing anything. They requested to, to put the uh, contract in abeyance. And then according to um, a, a fairly critical editorial written in the Enterprise, the guy that was responsible for it played tennis for a year and never came back to Falmouth. Um, so uh, the Enterprise was actually, uh, like the idea in general of the Strawberry Festival, did not like the fact that the Rogers Producing Company would be the ones that would be running it. Um, they were prescient uh, and, uh, and were, were absolutely right because of some of the problems that took place. So um, I, I took here uh, some images of the, an image here of a screenshot of the Rogers contract for you to look at. But basically, they had a really simple form of formula. The idea is that they would create a lot of pre-event fundraising, effectively do um, a, an absolute blanket marketing campaign with television, radio, newspapers throughout the region to bring people into the town uh, for the pageant, uh, for, the, uh, for the event, and did other things like they had, um, um, I'll talk about some of the actual events they had in a second, um, but they, they also provided a director costume stage lighting scripts um, uh, to put on this huge pageant, and some of them had hundreds of people, uh, you know, that were, that participated in, um, in the creation of some of these pageants. Um, and, um, you know, as you can see, if you're looking here through the contract, you can kind of see some of the things that they, that they said that they were going to do. Um, they guaranteed a finished and polished production that will be a credit to all concerned as uh, number 12, the very last item here on their, uh, on their contract. I'm not really sure that, um, that um, all concerned uh, felt the same way about it as, uh, as the, the Rogers Producing Company did by the end of the event. Um, but we'll talk about what happened. So um, these were some of the things that they did to try and get pre-sales and create a lot of money for the uh, for the event that would help we help it pay for pay for itself. So um, one of the things that they did was they sold these wooden uh, nickels. And um, if you read it here, it says this wooden souvenir, unbroken, uh, is exchangeable in trade in any store of Cape Cod and is redeemable for face value in the United States. In other words, you would buy these, support the um, uh, support the um, uh, the the um, uh, the festival, and then um, and then you could redeem them at local merchants who were participating uh, in the uh, in the um, you know in the promotion. Um, it was a way for the merchants to both um, basically provide a coupon to people that would help subsidize the the event, um, and, you know, and then you would come in and uh, you would you would buy some things in their store and get a little small discount of it, proceeds of which would go to the festival. Uh, the issue was that these things couldn't be broken. Um, I'm going to talk about some of these disasters that took place with them afterwards, but uh, I'll, I'll, I can maybe talk about some now. These things were super flimsy. People would write that you would pick it up and it would break. So a lot of them were just unredeemable then. Um, and if you look at the date here, they had to be uh, used before June 14th at 2 p.m. Well, only one problem with that. The festival started on June 14th at 2 p.m. So um, they all had to be redeemed before the festival started. And a lot of people didn't know that. Um, and, and they went in like after the festival or during the festival to try and buy things with them and were told they had no more value anymore. Um, I was shocked actually to find an image of this online. Someone was selling them on one of the um, auction sites and I was able to grab a, a screenshot of this, but this is the actual 1951 um, uh, wooden nickel in quotes that, uh, that were created. Another play that they had was they created a, a, a beard growing contest, which they called the Brothers of the Brush. This top image is from a different uh, Brothers of the Brush in a different uh, community. Um, this one is actually, the bottom one is actually from Falmouth. It's taken from the Enterprise. And the idea was that you would uh, pay a fee to enter the contest and uh, you would be able to buy a permit to be allowed to allow yourself to shave or women, uh, you know, uh, women would also get their, could buy them to get their husbands to shave if they didn't like it. 
Um, and, um, you know, they had uh, people if you also if somebody shaved without buying a permit, they could get fined or put in jail. It was like a, an early fund, uh, a fundraising um, uh, and marketing ploy, you know. Um, again, uh, talking about the the guy that was in Mad Men that just uh, that just died, the founder of the um, of the of the agency in Mad Men, um, the actor who just uh, passed away. Um, these were some early uh, forays into you know sort of viral marketing that were taking place, and um, and this was this was part of the the um, uh, Rogers formula. Um, these were all widely mocked by people in Falmouth. Um, I'll, I'll show you an image uh, later on uh, dur during the contest uh, that someone sent into the enterprise to mock the whole uh, beard, beard process, but uh, we'll get there in a second. Another thing they did for pre-sales was they sold these hats. Now, people suggested, why don't you sell hats like the pickers actually wear, like people actually working on the strawberry fields actually wear. And uh, the committee thought this didn't make any sense because they wouldn't be able to make money. Rogers had a formula. Rogers formula was you get a felt hat, it's easy to make, it's replicatable. Um, you just stick a badge on there, stick a feather in it, and um, you can make thousands of these as needed uh, and sell them as, as we go along. Um, the only problem is they didn't do a good job of actually making them. Uh, they ran out of, of the commemorative badges. You can see one of the commemorative badges here on the hat, which was stuck to the hat and won a pin right here at Cape Cod Festival, June 1951, that uh, Miss Nancy Clark is wearing here in the image as well. Um, uh, but in any case, um, uh, th th this was also another kind of fundraising disaster that they had. Um, and at the end of the festival, there were thousands of hats that, that just weren't sold. Um, finally, another thing they did was the pageant. There were pre-sales of the pageant. Um, we know how the pageant went just from the title, From Indians to Strawberries was the name of the pageant. Um, you know, of course, uh, From Indians to Strawberries. Well, guess what, guys? The first people that were cultivating and harvesting strawberries were the Native Americans in, in, in this region. Um, you know, so uh, um, so that's uh, uh, it's it's not like we we started with one and got to the other. They were always all the same, all there. So, um, uh, but these historical projects were really the bread and butter. On the right left hand side of the image, you can see here um, some of the historical. Basically, they had the director, this young guy, Harry Miller. Um, uh, you know, when he came to town with a big truck filled with grease paint and, and stage lighting and outfits um, and solicited stories of all the mythic events of the Cape. And you could sort of see how people were thinking about themselves on the Cape, how each of the towns thought to think about themselves and what their important events were. And, you know, there are all these kind of hagiographic events of, um, uh, you know, if the, that you can kind of read over here on the left hand side. Um, uh, they weren't really big into using history as a tool of social inquiry. Um, it was about creating a feel-good moment for, um, uh, for, for some of these issues of, um, uh, you know, uh, of, 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 what, of what certain people in the town felt was that were their important events. Um, they did, however, decide to have a, a 32 Portuguese folklore dancers were promised uh, from a folklore troupe in New Bedford who would be seen as representing, quote unquote, uh, strawberry pickers. Um, one thing that we hear about throughout the festival is not really strawberry growers. Um, in almost all cases, what the, uh, the enterprise and, and most of the literature in the, in, the, um, in the program really refers to is strawberry pickers, um, which is interesting because it's about labor versus the people that were, um, you know, uh, versus, the, versus the people, the entrepreneurs that were growing this. Um, nonetheless, the whole complex between the growers and the pickers was essential to, um, you know, to, to the event. And these were dominated by Cape Verdean and, and Azorean uh, growers and pickers in Falmouth. Um, you can see this is actually an image of one of the rehearsals, I believe, for the um, for the pageant in Falmouth um, uh, from the Enterprise, kind of a lousy picture, but it gives you kind of a little idea. You can see what looks to be like a bunch of uh, teepees back here, um, uh, which, you know, of course, had nothing to do with, uh, with, the, with, with Native and Wampanoag uh, living dwellings uh, as they were uh, during this uh, during this time period of the, of the encounter trying to be represented. Um, you had someone also playing the role here of Catherine Lee Bates, uh, one of Falmouth's uh, favorite daughters, uh, who, uh, who also figured into the pageant. Um, Portuguese participation in this. So, so far, we've really talked about this all being dominated by people who are, and if you look here at all the episodes, historical episodes, uh, what we really see is the Rogers Company sort of imposing their notion of what uh, was happening in Falmouth on, uh, onto the Falmouth pageant. Um, Portuguese participation. Well, the committee actually first recognizes the importance of the Portuguese in their um, in in the in the event, um, and actually, I'm, I'm going to show you a little later on. There's a um, uh, they they actually reach out to the Portuguese consul to try and get the Portuguese consul to participate. Um, you know, and they even talk about uh, the fact that the um, um, 
you know, the, por the Portuguese uh, uh, it was basically, they talked about the Portuguese as important, but really the Portuguese were just the draw. They were the attraction, right? Um, it was a way to get people to, to, you know, to market the strawberry crop, but they really weren't interested in supporting the strawberry crop as we will soon see. What was really the, the emphasis on this was trying to get tourists and get, in, you know, get, get the word out that Falmouth was a really a great tourist destination. Don't forget Peterson owned the Cape Cotter. And in fact, um, a number of the hotels in, the, in town opened early that year um, pro, uh, so that it would coincide with the Strawberry Festival. So this was uh, really an, an, an effort on the part of some of the tourist industry to try and get itself off the ground. Um, Manuel Raposa uh, points out that, um, um, uh, who's a strawberry grower, you know, points out that, uh, that only a small percentage of the growers really even got contacted about the, uh, about the event. Um, and you know, many Portuguese were just curious about, you know, what, what they wanted concrete ways that the festival could help. And those answers were never really forthcoming. Um, uh, you know, um, um, they, really effectively, the, uh, um, uh, they, they were sort of said that this is really important. The Portuguese looked at it and just didn't really see how, how it was ever really gonna help them. Um, they actually had some ideas that could help them. For example, the growers were getting creamed uh, by having to bid against everyone else when they brought their crops to Boston. And not only that, your crops are rotting when you're in Boston, right? So uh, you're in a situation where you're kind of in a seller's, uh, um, a buyer's market. And if they thought that if they could maybe as part of this have an auction where, where buyers would come to Falmouth and actually buy the crops in Falmouth, this would be a great boon to the, uh, to the growers. The committee did not go for this. Um, and you know, much of the input of the Portuguese was kind of left out with a couple of important exceptions. Um, uh, uh, Marina um, uh, Andrews here, um, of, uh, Marina and Tony Andrews, Andrews Farm um, is, uh, is here as this picture when I, when I put uh, Portuguese uh, participation um, because it's really important to point out that Cape Verdeans um, and Azorians, and especially in, especially Cape Verdeans, were really involved in this event, um, as we'll as we'll see um, uh, quite soon. Um, but uh, Marina Andrews, especially, she ends up taking one of the leading roles in promoting the event, um, and actually picks up the banner after the end of the Strawberry Festival to carry it on for the next year, uh, and becomes a key figure in that. She ends up winning the wooden nickels contest um, to see who could collect. Um, it was like a, a wooden nickel poker. You had to get. A certain number with a certain number of, of colors and and uh, from different places and she she got it she ended up using her prize money uh to pay for a float that was then in one of the parades uh the the, the festival parade that got put on um which actually then was won by marina and tony andrews um, uh, so they, they were key figures in this uh, in this whole event and um I, I think that also they took a lot of lessons away from it as we'll as we'll talk about as well um uh, as we'll talk about as well so as, as, the, um, as I started to say, sales lagged for everything. All the pre-sales that they thought they were going to get weren't working out. Uh, this is the, uh, the letter here on the right from the, uh, that was written to the, to the Portuguese consul in which the committee invited the Portuguese president. If you look at the date of this, it's right in the beginning of the event planning in January of 1951. Interestingly, they don't start reaching out to the Portuguese in Falmouth until really about a month before the event. Um, uh, uh, it's really not until mid-May that they start to reach out to the Portuguese community. And really, that's only when things start to go really south. They start to realize that, um, that they're not getting the sales that they had hoped for. A lot of them, the felt hats are a disaster. The wooden nickels are a disaster. The beard contest is a disaster. Um, I'm going to actually fast forward here very quickly and show you a great picture. Um, this was sent into the enterprise by someone joking about the, um, if you look at this picture here, um, uh, 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 joking about the... Uh, about the whole brothers of brother of the brush, they sent in a billy goat, um, sort of mocking that this is this is one of the entrants in the beard growing contest. Um, uh, so uh, I, I don't know. I thought that was actually pretty pretty funny when I came across this uh, this great picture. Um, but anyway, it's a whole. There's all kinds of disasters with the uh, with the event, and they start to bring in um, uh, some of the the Kid Verde and Azorian growers and, and um, uh, community in order to try and promote the event and reaching out to them. And interestingly. Um, uh, you know, they, um, uh, they, they're facing a couple of issues here with the lack of or the apathy among these communities. Um, moreover, there was a huge shortage of, of uh, pickers in 1951. Um, there's, they were getting a lot of competition from other places. Um, the growers, including people like Tony Andrews and all these people that you've seen their names in, the, in this list, um, all voted against um, raising the wages of the pickers. Uh, we often talk about these communities as monolithic, the Portuguese, 
or you know the Portuguese strawberry growers. But this really belies a lot of complexity that's taking place here because you have growers and you have pickers. A lot of the pickers are from Cape Verde. A lot of the owners are from Cape Verde. A lot of the pickers are from the Azores. Many of the pickers are from uh, are from the Azores. Um, so you have class issues cross-cutting this. You also have geographic and racial um, 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 differences also intersecting with, with, with some of these uh, class issues. So there's all kinds of things in play here about who controls labor, um, who decides who gets paid for what, uh, and et cetera. So um, what happens is most of the growers decide, uh, they vote, and the cartel basically says, we're not going to raise the wages. There was some dissension. Uh, Jack Marshall, for example, wanted to raise the, the, the wage given to um, to uh, pickers for a box uh, does not um, uh, doesn't win the case, and he he agrees that he's going to actually pay the five cent pr five cents per box price uh, that was uh, that was uh, standard at the time. So um, the, the the bigger issue though was that nobody really explained how this was going to help uh, the, the 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 Portuguese farmers, um, and uh, they didn't really have any concrete ways to do this except to say, well, you guys need to market, and it's going to be really good for you. It's going to you're going to it's going to pick up business. As it turns out, this actually may well have taken place. Um, this would have been a disastrous year. Falmouth was faced with a huge drought uh, that had occurred the year before. Um, the actual weekend of the festival turned out to be weather-wise a nightmare for the growers as well as for the people going to the festival. It rained all weekend. It was incredibly humid. And um, the, the, they, they took a huge bath that weekend uh, because most of the strawberries were rotting very quickly as a result of the weather conditions, something that happens every year, by the way. Um, but this particular weekend was particularly difficult. So for the Portuguese to be able to, with a picker shortage, take off the weekend while they needed, while they needed to get the crops in was not something they were looking forward to. By the way, um, I just want to underline here some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, the growers that went to the tea ticket schoolhouse, uh, which is where the um, Cape Cod um, or the Falmouth um, uh, Cape Verdean political club would meet, uh, as well as the St. Anthony's club, which was a Holy Ghost hall. So we talked about some of these places both last year or last semester. Uh, in the uh, in the course with Lou, but we also talked about last week the, the importance of that St. Anthony's Club Hall in Brickhill Road um, to uh, to the broader community, and that's where, when when the committee, the the non Portuguese, non Cape Verdean, non Azorean community wanted to wanted to meet uh, these communities, they went to the places where their most important clubs were, including the uh, the Tea Ticket School where the uh, Cape Verdean Club was, and where uh, uh, the St. Anthony's Club was um, in in Brickhill Road. Um, so I would say that um, from the beginning, Tony Andrews is actually um, quite involved, um, even early, quite early on. Um, and uh, he actually um, decides, and the Portuguese are actually quite responsible for the things that actually had to do with strawberries. And um, one of the things that Bertrand Tomlinson did was lobby, and some of these other figures like Jack Sambade, uh, Manuel Raposa, uh, Alphonse de Mello, and Tony Andrews, Tony and Marina Andrews, they really lobbied to have events that were really about the strawberries and really about strawberry growing and really about what actually took place with the agriculture of strawberries. Um, and uh, only for the grace of these individuals was this actually included in the festival. Um, so um, Tony Andrews takes up the, uh, the chairmanship of the picker contest um, and, um, and has Jack Rose's beds off Central Avenue as the place where the, where the, uh, the contest took place. Um, basically they had all of the contestants were there in rows. Some of the people distributed boxes so they could do it a little bit quicker. Um, they were judged not only on the number of strawberries they picked, uh, but also the quality of the berries that they selected as opposed to the ones they left on the vine. Um, did they miss any berries? Did they miss like really good berries or did they get all the berries that, that were there to be got? Um, and, um, you know, um, it, it was, um, uh, it was a, an interesting contest, but really there were two very, very clear winners. Falmouth and Gomes um, uh, picked 8.75 quarts in 15 minutes, and she got 2,150 points based on the quality of the pick berries, what she missed and didn't miss. Um, second prize went to uh, Alvita Lobo from uh, East Fair Haven, um, who uh, got you know slightly fewer points based on, she, she picked a few more, a little bit more strawberries, but I guess she must have missed some or didn't have the same quality as the ones that, um, uh, that Ann Gomes picked. Ann Gomes was, I don't know if anybody knows her. If you do, please tell me, please, please remark on this. Um, in the chat or, or when we have our, our Q&A afterwards. Um, but from what I could understand about her, she was a really interesting and humble person. She showed up late uh, to the event, didn't know any of the rules, uh, just got in and did her thing and, um, and, you know, and, and, and blew away the competition. Um, uh, to give you an idea though, um, uh, of, of you know, you know, the pickers were really exalted. In fact, they referred to this, uh, the, the, um, the festival referred to this as a world championship of strawberry picking. They did, they were very clear about designating that. They wanted to make this a big deal. 
Um, and um, uh, the first uh, winner of this world championship was Anne Gomes. Now, um, they really exalted these individuals, individuals who were not during the year and not uh, during the rest of the time this was all taking place, uh, really looked up to in the community. The pickers, you know, lived in pretty lousy conditions when they uh, when they came to town um, in picker sheds or picker shacks or, uh, uh, you know, these picker huts, as they're called. They're, they're called different things by different people. Um, and, um, you know, and they got very, very poor wages. Like I mentioned, five cents a quart. But let's think about what that means. At a nickel per quart, like 200 boxes in a 10 hour shift is a real good yield. Um, and at a nickel a box, you're getting about 10 bucks a day, um, which, you know, is not a bad wage for um, uh, in 1951 for, uh, for for this kind of labor, but it's also not a good wage at all. And you know, as awesome as Ann Gomes was, she would have picked around 280 boxes with her, uh, you know, with her work, which would have gotten her about 14 dollars for. And you know, she, no one's picking that that uh, you know amount of strawberries. It's backbreaking work. You're in the sun all day, and you know, um, uh, no, and you can see that nobody was wearing those little felt beanies. You know, there's straw hats that, are, that, that individuals are wearing here. And you can see most of the women in, you know, depicted here are, are Cape Verdean women um, who, are, who, are, who are pickers here. And, um, um, you know, the, the, this was on the front page of the newspaper. This is actually the bottom picture is from the next year. It's from the 1952, actually. Um, but, you know, these pickers were actually quite, uh, um, were looked up to in the context of this event, but were not looked up to in the context of their role as laborers in the strawberry industry. So um, it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition that I would, I would bring up um, with how the Strawberry Festival um, sort of used and relied upon a lot of these commu this community um, to for ends that were really had nothing to do with necessarily with supporting the strawberry growers, but had everything to do with supporting um, the tourist industry. Um, another major factor of how the, uh, the Portuguese community was able to bail out the festival um, were, were uh, the, 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 anoint, the uh, anointing of a festival queen or the crowning rather of a festival queen. So basically what they would do is, uh, this was another one of the Roger schemes. Um, the festival queen was nominated, was, um, uh, was, was uh, selected based primarily on the amount of pre-ticket, uh, pre-event uh, sales of tickets, of entrance tickets that she sold. So the more entrance tickets that you sold pre-event sales uh, uh, took place, um, uh, the, the higher point total you would get. Um, the committee that did the selecting was almost entirely non-Portuguese. There were 20 names over here. I, I found like two uh, women that were definitely uh, Portuguese or Cape Verdean extraction or Azorian abstraction. Um, uh, one that was potentially, uh, uh, um, I, I don't know, I would have to confirm if Ms. Marshall here was, was, was a, a Portuguese. This was a, a large Portuguese family as well. Uh, shorthand for um, Maciel. Uh, in Portuguese, much like Andrews was shorthand for and Andred, and um, and uh, many some of these others, uh, uh, many many other name changes that took place for Portuguese town. However, of the twenty, uh, at one point the enterprise was keeping a running tally of who was ahead and who was winning, and what the what the tally was of who was who was uh, in first place for the queen. And of the twenty contestants, half of the women were young women of Portuguese uh, or of descent, were the Cape Verdean or Azorean women, which means they were the ones driving the ticket sales. Um, they were the ones doing all of the legwork, right, to make sure that um, that the, that funds were raised for uh, for the event. And in selling those things, they were going door to door. They were, uh, uh, you know, going to businesses to do this. They also took on the largest role in promoting the festival as well to the town. Um, so again, a major role that they played um, in in this uh, in this festival, even though they were kind of left out of planning and the organization and all that. So at the end of the whole thing, uh, the winner of the event is Cynthia Augusta, who ends up marrying a Batello and becomes C Cynthia Batello. She's a really well-known uh, Falmouth resident um, uh, and uh, a, good, a good friend of Lou White um, also. Um, and um, uh, you know, she, she ends up becoming the very first uh, queen, uh, largely as a result of the fact that she was from a fairly well-connected family, the Augustas, um, uh, and, um, and, and also had ties to Otis as well, where she sold a lot of tickets. Um, Otis was actually quite involved in the festival as well, both in participating in the parade and also uh, sponsoring some events. There were a couple of pageants uh, put on or dances put on. One was the Queen's Ball, which was held at the rec center. And another was the um, was an officer's ball put on at Otis. Uh, both of these were attended by Cynthia Botello. She also got some other awards for winning. Um, um, uh, she, um, you know, she also got to go to New York. 
Um, there were also some disasters that took place that I'll talk about in a second, but this is her and her court, the women that really helped to promote and, and put on this event, uh, half of which were young uh, women of Cape Verde and Azorean descent. Um, the parade and the floats, this was another thing where the Portuguese were kind of an afterthought till much later on. Um, there were no Portuguese entrants uh, in this until, until almost the last uh, few weeks when Tony Andrews, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Marina Andrews won the nickel, wooden nickel contest and used the 75 prize money to, um, to create a professional float, to pay someone to create a professional float. There were two categories, professional floats versus, um, versus um, non-professional or amateur floats. Um, and you can see that uh, in this parade, uh, went down Main Street. Uh, in fact, the viewing stand was right in front of the Falmouth Public Library um, and included the selectmen. The senator was a marshal. The, the, the U.S. senator from, from uh, was, a, was a marshal. Um, the, um, uh, uh, and included the Portuguese consul also came. He crowned the queen and was on the review stand. Um, uh, he, um, um, he, he also participated in some of the other events. Um, and by some estimates, around 10,000 people came out for the Strawberry Festival Parade. The town was filled with bunting. Um, there were around 25 floats at the end of it, uh, although around 30 plus floats were promised. Um, many of the floats decided not to pay any of the entrance fees um, and were sort of, um, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, you know, illegal floats, if you want to call them that, um, of people who wanted to participate but didn't want to pay the entrance fee. They were excluded from winning prizes, but they nonetheless participated. Um, Tony Andrews won that came in first prize for a float that you can see here depicting, well, guess what? It wasn't only the uh, individuals in the, in the, um, in the organization, um, the, the Chamber of Commerce that were kind of using the notion of the pickers as representative and to win prizes. Here we have uh, a float depicting pickers and who is on the float, but our actual pictures at the Tony Andrews farm. So, um, you know, this is um, uh, another interesting thing about these relations between labor and, and the people that own the farms. Uh, as well. And you can see here one of the bands. There was a brass band, a Portuguese Philharmonic brass band from New Bedford. I don't know anything about how they were arranged. I don't know um, if the uh, if the console had anything to do with that. Um, I came across completely, completely randomly. I was doing a whole nother project um, at the time um, at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, uh, looking through the console, consular files where all the New Bedford console files are located. Um, they were about to get thrown into the trash until Mary Vermette actually grabbed them. Uh, uh, they rented a van and made sure that somebody got a hold of these, um, uh, you know, a hold of these. Uh, to its great shame, the UMass Dartmouth uh, Library refused the the documents, uh, which is really an embarrassment for that library. Um, uh, uh, but uh, fortunately, the New Bedford Whaling Museum was able to grab it, and um, and it's a treasure trove of information about the Portuguese community. While flipping through this, uh, looking for other stuff, I came across these documents about the the festival and that the Chamber of Commerce had written to the. Um, uh, written to the, um, uh, uh, you know, to the to the to the consul, and um, actually squealed with delight in the middle of the the uh, the, the library, uh, causing like twenty people to look at me. But most of them were all researchers, and they were like, "Ah, you got one of those, didn't you?" Uh, they all knew what I uh, what I must have stumbled upon, um, you know, in my own little world of uh, of the things that I find interesting. Um, and indeed, I had. Um, but in any case, um, I don't really know why this Portuguese band was there, or who, who brought them, but there was a lot of uh, connection between Thomas Portuguese community and New Bedford. So there's lots of ways that that band uh, might have, um, might, you know, might have been, been, been there. Uh, I'd love to find out. So um, what was the, uh, so these were kind of the events that took place. Um, uh, there were some disasters that took place as the, as the weekend unfolded. There was horrible weather. It was really bad, was terribly humid. Um, uh, the, the festival itself, um, you know, people had really mixed feelings about it. Some people participated, but they thought that it was kind of a disaster. Most people were not very happy with the Rogers company. Um, you know, they overpromised a lot of stuff. Not only did they come up 9,000 short, they promised their pageant would have 400 actors. Uh, there were only about 200 participants, which, you know, is still quite a lot, but half of what they, you know, of what they promised. Um, you know, uh, um, in, in some ways, you know, it wasn't only Harold Hill that, uh, that the Rogers company reminded me of. Um, you know, but it also reminded me of, uh, you know, Billy McFarland and the Fire Festival that recently just took place. I don't know if anybody uh, here that's um, that's watching this knows what I'm talking about when I talk about the Fire Festival. Uh, but uh, it was another huge, a recent disaster of a, a promoted festival where everybody got, you know, basically uh, robbed. Um, uh, uh, of course, the Rogers Company got to take home at 6000 and 6000 and they, they got paid. Um, most of the postmortems in the, in the enterprise were really upset with the fact that this somehow had gotten away from Falmouth. 
and um, you know wasn't really a festival that was that was about Falmouth. Um, and um, uh, you know, and uh, and unfortunately, they um, they um, um, uh, felt that the the festival was kind of a disaster based on you know based on just that. But there were other issues too. You know, um, the uh, Rogers Company had promised that Gulfville Field would be uh, picked up afterwards of the debris. This was actually a working uh, playing field, right? They had sports contests there, um, um, and um, uh, you know, the whole thing was just strewn with nails when they broke down the sets. Um, uh, that, you know, that weren't picked up. The school administrator also wanted to know why all the fields that were used were just a disaster. So the whole thing kind of was a bit of a mess. Um, poor uh, Cynthia Augusta uh, was promised by, um, by Pitts, the, uh, the Rogers uh, agent, that she would be given a new wardrobe as part of her prize uh, for a trip that she took with her mother to New York, all expenses paid. Um, and um, when she went to the merchants that she had been promised by Pitts were, that were gonna provide this wardrobe, they had never heard of it at all, causing her, you know, a great deal of embarrassment, um, according to some of the merchants themselves, who worked very quickly to try and rectify this, especially Mr. Isaacson, um, and, um, and and get her set up with a, with the wardrobe that she was promised, even though they weren't told that they that was one of the things that they that they would be, you know, required to do. Um, and plus, it lost quite a bit of money. Um, the um, the event though wasn't a total disaster. We should point out um, in in terms of actually as a festival. So uh, one of the things, that I, some of the things that I think that, that maybe that, that were interesting about it was it, it really did create a lot of promotion for the strawberries of Falmouth and the strawberry industry in Falmouth. Um, it's, it was kind of a losing battle. Um, the strawberry industry was always, already in great decline. And really the, the 1950s is the death knell of the, of the industry. It's kind of interesting where you have a moment where on the one hand you have a strawberry industry or a strawberry festival uh, uh, trying to promote strawberries at the same time that the industry itself is really, is really tanking. Um, they may have actually helped to prolong uh, the profitability of that industry for a couple of years, um, given that a lot of the press helped them to weather what would have been a really disastrous year with, that, with, a, with this horribly humid and, and wet weekend in the middle of the harvest, in a really key harvest weekend, um, causing a lot of the crop to rot. And, um, you know, this is an issue that um, uh, was talked about by the Massachusetts, um, one, of the, one of the Massachusetts uh, agricultural officials said that, um, that he felt that the festival actually saved the industry in Falmouth and had other repercussions as well. Like it, it really raised all boats. So a lot of the other, uh, um, you know, in New Hampshire, Tony Andrews and Marina Andrews go to New Hampshire and, um, you know, they, uh, they run into and they talk to a New Hampshire farmer, strawberry farmer in the Merrimack, uh, around the Merrimack River. Uh, who says that um, he attributed the Falmouth Festival and all the promotion of strawberries during the, you know, during the, the lead up to the, to the summer uh, harvest uh, to the fact that he had a, a banner year. Like he said, he sold more than he'd ever uh, sold before, like something like 12,000 quarts of strawberries. And he told Tony Andrews and Marina Andrews that, that the reason was the promotion of the event, which obviously reached as far away as New Hampshire, raising everyone's interest in strawberries in general. So um, you know, it's possible that it actually might have uh, might have actually worked, um, despite um, despite some of the um, uh, the failings of the uh, of the event. Um, uh, it also gave some visibility to uh, to, to Falmouth growers as well. Um, I should point out that almost every single um, week from January until not almost every single week from January until the event, and then for several weeks after the event, um, there was an article, several articles, often about the strawberry industry in the town. Um, it, a lot of times it was about what was happening with the festival, but it was also about what were some of the issues with the, the industry? What was the history of the industry? They talked also about the community. So it was kind of a way for, to actually bring some visibility to the community, um, but the community meaning the, uh, the Cape Verde and Azorian communities, um, and also the strawberry uh, industry as well. Um, and some of the people that participated in it um, actually end up going on to have um, to understand uh, marketing in a lot of ways. In other words, they, 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 they really learned a lot from this event um, that they took with them. I think that um, Tony and Marina Andrews, who obviously uh, had a lot of good ideas, um, given their, um, it's, it's very clear by the fact that uh, um, their participation in the festival, all of the great ideas that they had, um, and they're also, they're interested in this stuff, but they also, you know, also learned, made contacts um, that helped them to create what really becomes an ongoing marketing campaign of strawberries that still existed to today in some ways, right? I mean, Tony Andrews Farm, the notion of pick your own, this was an innovation. Um, you know, um, uh, the idea that the st a strawberry farm could be a tourist attraction is something that they really took uh, to heart. 
and um, you know, and promoted uh, uh, until until they passed away, and is now uh, continuing with the um, with the farm that exists, uh, you know, Tony Anders farm that exists today. That all of you can all can still go to if you're interested. Um, you know, if you're interested. Um, another guy was Jack Sambay. This was a major uh, Azorian strawberry grower. Um, he um, also gets really quite involved in a lot of the marketing events. Was a person that that thought that marketing was really important for the strawberry crop in Falmouth, and um, he ends up. Uh, becoming a board member of the Cape Cod uh, Planning and Marketing Board that um, that that was found a way to disperse or that determined how to disperse the state's funds to promote agriculture um, or the Cape's the Cape's funds to to promote state funds for the for uh, for agriculture. Jack Sambia becomes a uh, board member of, uh, of of this, and you know it's pretty clear that his interaction with all of these um, you know uh, uh, um, uh, Chamber of Commerce members and all of some of these people that were involved in you know, these merchants on the Cape uh, led to some of these contacts that, that then sort of helped him to, to you know, find a, find a way doing some other things. Um, you know, also the Portuguese who had been talking about marketing for a long time, you know, got some ways that they might be able to do this. Um, and, um, and they actually took some of these lessons to heart. And um, the festival would then go, would go on again and last under the auspices of the, um, of the Chamber of Commerce for about another four or five years. Um, uh, the last one I believe is in 1955, that's run by them before St. Barnabas sort of takes over it as a, as a church festival and that they still have it this year. Um, obviously it's a much smaller scale. It's not the same kind of thing. There's, re there's really no um, uh, participation of Portuguese community uh, per se in the, in the event uh, as it was here. But in those first, in the, in the next five years, and I'm, I'm actually, I, I, the, 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 we, we're stopping here. Um, I don't really have enough time to go into the next five years. Uh, I need to do a lot more research, I think, before I feel comfortable really talking about it. But um, really, there's a big transformation that takes place. So first of all, in the, in the upcoming year, the Chamber of Commerce immediately gets in touch with the Portuguese community, like right off the bat. Um, and Marina Andrews actually takes quite a lead role. Um, uh, she um, is one of the people, actually, when the town is kind of like, ah, do we really want to do this? Uh, in fact, at one point, the committee says, uh, when they're planning on whether they're going to have an event or not. So we may have an event, but they agreed that the term festival should be avoided at all costs. Um, uh, they were just very, very jaded about the disaster that had taken place uh, the year before with the Rogers Company. And, um, you know, and, and really wanted to create a different event. And what they decided was that this would be a very Falmouth-centered celebration. Um, they would still have, they would get rid of the pageant, they would get rid of all the ridiculous fundraising, um, um, and uh, we're turning it to something that was really a celebration of strawberries and the strawberry industry. Um, and to do that, they really involved the Portuguese community. And, you know, these are all big names in the, you know, in the 1950s uh, uh, strawberry community uh, and people that were participating in, um, in these events um, or had been participating in the events um, uh, of the year before. Um, they were sort of asked to come back and, and continue in, in those roles. Um, uh, and, um, and they also decided uh, why the heck did we not have a strawberry shortcake contest, you know, in 1951? And um, they'd also decided to do that. So it, it seems like kind of a no-brainer. They did some other things too. They had a, a kite design contest, a kite flying contest, um, and, and some other events uh, as well. Um, but no strawberry, uh, uh, you know, no, no strawberry, uh, sh strawberry shortcake contest. So um, uh, this is something that they decided to do. Um, I guess that only someone from a company from Ohio would decide not to have a strawberry shortcake contest. If that company was from the Cape, they, they would have, that would have been the first thing that they would have thought to have. Um, but in any case, um, um, it, it really becomes a Falmouth centered event instead of a three day festival, it's a one day festival in subsequent years. Um, uh, but the real uh, sort of lessons that got taken out of this were really by Falmouth's tourist merchants who, um, you know, who, 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 who decided that the real legacy of strawberries was not, um, you know, well, we talk about the legacy of strawberries really being uh, um, the building trades, but one of the other great legacies of strawberries really, if you think about it, was the tourist trade, because that's how Falmouth started to really make its money um, in the intervening years. So um, I'm really hopeful that there are people that are here that might know something about the festival. Um, and I, I'm gonna just open up our, our discussion now uh, to, you know, to talk about the festival, to talk about this event. Um, and, uh, and also to mention that um, um, I, uh, my, my hope was actually to talk about some other things in the community, namely some of the, um, uh, the, the, the pageant, the beauty pageant that took place at, um, at um, uh, uh, the Cape Verdean Club in Falmouth. Um, and uh, if, we, if we do another one of these or maybe next time or uh, we, can, we can get to some of that stuff. Um, there was just such rich information here on this particular uh, event that I thought um, this, and this was one of the things that we talked about doing. Um, 
given that we've been going sequentially in our discussions, I, I thought this was the next best thing. So if we there's have any a couple, questions- and... We do have a couple in the chat from Tim. Okay, um, so let's see. Two of them. Has anyone seen the script for this particular historical uh, pageant staged by Rogers? I don't know of one. Um, if anybody has contacts at, um, um, you know, um, um, if, if, if anyone has contacts there at, um, at the, um, how do you call it, the, uh, uh, the Family Historical Society that might know if this one, if the script is floating around or if there's other images of it anywhere, I would love to be able to find out about those. I don't know um, necessarily those, if those exist. Um, you know, I looked at some of the, I did find online some of the other projects that they did, you know, I mean, they, they did a lot of, you know, scripts of minstrel shows, uh, music for minstrel shows and these kinds of things. Um, the Harry Miller himself, the 26 year old director was the one that wrote, and sort of wove together a lot of these stories. Um, they were basically, uh, the way they did it was there was a narrator that were four narrators that were hired um, who sort of told different parts of the story while action was taking place on the, uh, you know, um, on the field. Um, and they sold something like 2000 tickets to this, uh, to this pageant. So a lot of people went out, came out to see the pageant. Um, uh, interestingly. Um, so, sorry, if you do another session, could you mark in recent years? Okay, the South Coast Smith Lakes Trail Yeah, I would. Uh, if we do another one, I would love to do that. Um, I, in fact, have done some research um, in the past week on um, Falmouth's um, uh, Jamaican community as well, the J Jamaican immigrant community in Falmouth. I think there's a lot of uh, interesting. Um, th there's a lot of interesting parallels between sort of the early Cape Verdean Azorean communities that came in the 19th. Uh, late 19th, early 20th century, and some of the newer immigrant groups that have come to town. Um, um, most of these groups actually, uh, their community life really revolves around, or their sort of public community life revolves a lot around um, their participation in churches. Jamaican community, for example, has um, uh, a couple, there's a church in Hyannis and one in Falmouth, and they have, you know, kind of a public fun day where they invite people to come and ex experience um Jamaican culture, not, you know, not uh, as told by people who aren't Jamaican, uh, but by Jamaicans themselves. And, um, you know, um, uh, you know, you also have, um, uh, how do you call it? Um, uh, the, the Brazilian community also does, uh, you know, similar, uh, similar events as well um, uh, in different, you know, in different places in town um, or, or across the Cape, uh, across, across the Cape as well. Um, anyway. Let's see what else we have. Uh, Tim, I, have, I, I don't remember where I found it, um, uh, but it was it was a document that um, was just in the general consular file. Like they have, you know, different. It's it's broken up by years, I think, um, and and different files from different subjects. I think that this was in the correspondence file. So there was a one of the folders was specifically dedicated to correspondence with the Portuguese Portuguese or the you know the Portuguese communities or the the communities in. Uh, you know, in the um, in the in the, uh, the U.S. Barbara, we didn't know about this series. Oh, um, uh, well, that's surprising to me about them not knowing about it because I actually did send a uh, um, I, I actually did send a notice to uh, uh, to the museum. Um, but you know, I understand these things get lost in the shuffle. Um, I I will um, I will be happy to uh, to send these out in the future to uh, to anybody who wants them. I think that uh, also the, the library has a pretty extensive mailing list and, and, uh, and also 